Hi, I'm Greg, and this is my review of Secrets of the Lost Tomb, the cooperative pulp action board game. Secrets of the Lost Tomb is a game for one to six players and takes about two hours to play. It's a game about exploring an ancient tomb that has appeared mysteriously due to a three-tailed comet that is in the sky, which occurs every 113 years. You and your friends are part of an internal order of Perseus, Persis, Persis, and are assigned to go into the tomb based on the scenario chosen and investigate and destroy the evil monster that has risen to destroy the world. Secrets of Love's Tomb is a scenario-based game. So out of the scenario book for the base game, you will get this, which is the core scenario book. Um, and inside the book, you'll see various scenarios that have a title. They have a description of what the scenario is, a special setup rules for the tomb. Um, also some special rules, like if you have to put traps down, or if there's special tiles that you need to place, or special rooms that you have to place out like before you begin the game. Um, and then there is specific win conditions, lose conditions, scenario, triggered effects, and various things you read out loud as you're exploring this tomb. Like, so the setup of the game typically looks like this. When you choose your hero, you'll gain a hero cutout, a uh, cardboard cutout that you put into a stand, like this guy here who is Theodore Roosevelt. The stand for all the players, this is a setup for a typically for a one player game, um, you would place a stand so at the entrance and all players if you're playing up to six players will also start at this entrance tile now if we take a look at the starting tiles on the back they have a special icon that doesn't match the other tiles which is like this one to indicate this is a setup tile uh, the setup tile also has um a shop icon which is what this purplish uh, icon which matches these cards here that you can spend um, essentially soul shards that you collect from your enemies to, to buy stronger and better equipment. And adjacent to the downward staircase car, you want to place this setup tile, which is the Pharaoh's Hall setup tile. This is uh, basically when you use the stairs on this tile, you end up on this tile. And the final setup tile that you use in every scenario is this one here, which is a level 3 tile that is known as the Mongol's Hall. And as you can see here, it has a rope icon on it, which means that as you're exploring the tomb, you need to find a room that lets you to ascend or descend to this tile. Uh, since it's level three, you'll most likely be ascending. Uh, but you need a rope that ties to this room, to another room, and find the rope, etc., etc. So, uh, if anybody's played Betrayal of House on the Hill, it's similar to how the basement works in Betrayal, where you have to find, basically, the entrance to it. So, it's good to put this off to, like, pretty close to the board, uh, but leave enough room, uh, because this game does have a lot of rooms to explore in the different dungeons, and they connect together quite nicely in the puzzle piece type of thing. Now, one other thing I would like to point out on these tiles is you'll notice these little green comet tail icons. These are effectively entrances and exits of the room. So, if your explorer is on this tile, like so, and it wants to leave the room, you can either go down the stairs or go out one of the entrances. And we'll get to how that works in a little bit. So, once again, I have the game set up for one player. So basically when I chose a player, you can either choose randomly or you can sort through the players. There are a lot of players, characters in this game. Uh, I have all the expansions as well, and so once you have all the expansions kind of mixed together, you get a nice fat stack of character sheets like this, which also have corresponding um, cardboard tokens, and as you can see from this, there's a lot. Um, so there's a lot of diversity between the characters too. Some of them are, sim are like upgrades of other characters. Uh, there's also miniatures that you can buy separately. Uh, this bag contains all the hero miniatures that I've gone so far, and this bag contains the monsters and basically bosses. Um, the miniatures themselves are pretty cool. Uh, I'll show you one here for it, for the one of the death horse ones, 
and as you can see it's pretty detailed um, <coughs> and it's cool to have these miniatures because they, they added a kind of a three-dimensional depth to the game I'm a fan of a huge fan of miniature games uh, as well as miniatures themselves in board games so for me um, these were a must buy for others uh, the core game is still pretty expensive so you may just be content with uh, the cardboard standees which are pretty quick to separate and pretty quick to set up because they have the same image as a character sheet so let me take let me show you the character sheet here this is a character sheet for Theodore Roosevelt who is a pioneer um, on the front it has the stats your starting equipment your starting stats um, down here it has the bonuses you get as and the penalties you face as you gain and lose courage um, down on here it starts with what is your starting audacity what is your starting health and what is your starting courage up here you have your different stats which some of you might find familiar style if you played games like Arkham Horror or Betrayal of the House on the Hill that's how many dice you roll when you're trying to see if you succeed at a skill test um, also these two boxes here represent the different special abilities that this character has if the character has a infinity symbol uh, like the one here that's green then it means that this ability can be used any amount, infinite amount of times. If it has a white circle with a number in it, it means it can only be used that many times. So Theodore Roosevelt's second ability here has a one, which means I can only use it once per game. If they have a, a symbol there but with no number in it, it's the same thing as an infinity symbol. I don't know if that was a misprint or if intentional, but uh, that is how that works. So now the game is set up for the initial scenario. Uh, for the most part. Um, there are some things that I haven't put out, like I didn't put a pile out for the soul shards or the damage markers, the traps, the spawn markers. I kind of kept them in their baggies because otherwise it takes over the entire table and it's a big mess and whatnot. So for now, I just put these to the side, but you feel free to put them in easy to reach piles, whatever, you, whatever you're most comfortable with and depending on the size of your table. I do want to emphasize though, you're going to need a lot of room for this game. Um, because you're going to be exploring the dungeon and it's going to take over a lot of space. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff to the base game. This is not even including a lot of the expansion cards, which are extra stacks. Some of them are mixed in, but a lot of, but there are still a lot in the box that I haven't put out. But we'll get into the details of the different phases of the game now. So there's the adventure phase, where the, which is like uh, all the adventures will go and do their various actions. The various actions that you can do is move. Uh, you move based on your dexterity value. Also on the back of the character sheet, it has a biography and stats. This is all flavor. Um, and you don't, you, it's fun to read if you want to learn more about your character and you want to know some pertinent information, but it doesn't affect the gameplay at all. So, um, there, and then this token here is used, it's a basically a yellowish white token and matches the symbol on the special ability section. And so for here, for Theodore, since he has one use of this thing, you would take one of these tokens just to represent that he has one action for that special ability to use for the game. And once it's used, you just discard the token to remind yourself that you can't use it anymore. Some characters have more than one use. Some characters have infinite use, but if, it, if it has four, you'd grab four, et cetera, et cetera. Another token that you need is the search token. It's this triangular token with a green, yellow, and red symbol on them. The game starts with the green symbol on top, and then as you draw comet cards during the tune, uh, during the comet phase, uh, which I'll go over in a little bit, you might have to rotate this token. What this token does is it basically uh, is used when you want to search a room for treasure. You would look on the back of the manual, and you will see here a treasure search uh, table, which is also on the reference sheet that comes with the game, like so. And what you do is you look at which color you're currently at, roll the dice. When you find uh, the one through six, you will see that you have uh, a trap, um, various other icons, including treasure here, and a compass icon. The compass icon means that you have an adventure. Well, I'm sorry, the Skull and Crossbones is not a trap, it's a misadventure. I'll get to that in a little bit, um, what it means. And then, as you see with the yellow, you can actually cause a spawn, sorry, yeah, you can spawn a swarm 
or a monster onto the board by searching and getting a low roll. In red, the likelihood that misadventures and spawning increases, but you also have a chance to find an artifact or uh, a treasure. So the higher the, the the harder it gets, the more valuable of a reward you might get, but of course the odds also go down. So it's something to keep in mind while playing the game and exploring the tomb. The other thing that you're going to need to start with is an overlay, which you will assemble the, the, the knobs on them. Uh, as you can see, I already have it assembled. You also get a green peg, which you mark your starting courage at. So Theodore has a courage starting at three. So you put at the plus three on the track. Uh, there's also dials that you will turn for health and for starting audacity. I'll get to what audacity is. Health is pretty self-explanatory. You reach zero, you die. Uh, throughout the game, you can lose health by combat, traps, exploring rooms. You gain health through various items um, and various locations. The next important thing is in the rule book, depending on the number of players you have, you will start with a different number of actions and a different number of companions. Each character will start with the same number of actions and the same number of companions based on how many players there are. So with a one-player game, you start with five companion cards, which are these, and they have a Indiana Jones hat and a whip on the back. The companions add different abilities. Some are used for combat. Some can be used for exploring. Some can be used to, um, for example, this guy gives you, the dog, gives you a plus two to all search checks. So if you're going to search a room and you roll the dice, whether you have green, yellow, or red, he will give you a plus two. And immediately when you get this companion, you gain two audacity points. So if you drew him at the beginning of the game, you would start with two more audacity than your character was supposed to. If you draw him later in the game, you would turn your knob plus two. Also, this character, as an action, can trade with an adventurer up to five rooms away. So you could send him to go pick up an item, give it to another adventurer, because you have your dog that will then go and do that kind of stuff. Other characters, for example, like this guy, you have to turn him sideways in order to um, exhaust him when you use him, and you get to perform one free combat action. During the upkeep phase, you refresh it back into a ready format. Some you have, Sometimes you have to roll for upkeep to see if something happens. Sometimes you just gain something in upkeep, like this guy, um, <clears throat> the Scotsman, gives you one courage every upkeep. Um, and also, you, when you gain this companion, you also gain a status effect of Fearless. So depending on the different characters and the different um, companions, you gain different abilities, uh, which is makes them very, very helpful and very, very useful. Um, also, you start you have some starting items. Theodore starts with a Bowie knife and a Winchester rifle. On the cards, you'll notice it has um, whether they are one-handed or two-handed underneath the title with how many. So like, for example, this is a dexterity weapon that is two-handed. This is a strength weapon that is one-handed. Uh, they also say how much damage they do, which is the teeth mark. So for example, the bowie knife does two damage and the Winchester rifle does four damage. Um, some of them have special abilities, like if your successes are greater than or equal to the creature's teeth rating, you may immediately perform one additional combat against the same creature. This ability triggers only once per combat and then on upkeep, because as it is a gun, you have to exhaust it when you use it, you roll a die, and on a one or a two, you would discard that gun. But you would only do the upkeep if you actually use the gun. You wouldn't do the upkeep if you didn't use the gun that round. Um, and then with the Bowie knife, you can also discard it to pass any one story check automatically. So the weapons can be pretty powerful in the game. You also get these action bullet tokens that on one side has a green action written on it, on the other side is a red reload. During the game, you'll take turns during the adventurer phase doing one by one actions. Obviously, with one player, you would be doing all your actions, but with more players, you have less actions, starting actions, but you would get you would do one, flip it over to reload, the next player would go, the next player would go until it goes back to you, then you do the next one. So it's an easy way to keep track of how many actions you've spent and how many actions you have remaining. Um, the last thing you need for setup also is to shuffle all of the tomb cards. You have the adventure cards, the item cards the Meteor Trail cards, like this card stack here. Um, you have items and artifacts and companions, and you want to shuffle all these pretty thoroughly. The only ones you don't really want to shuffle are the status effect cards, because those usually you gain a status, 
and you will draw a specific one out. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of these cards are double-sided, like the adventure and misadventure cards. Um, the creature cards are also double-sided, as you can see from here. There's one same creature on both sides. So the game comes with these covers like this for monsters and this for the misadventures that you can place on top of the deck so you don't see what's coming up. Alternatively, you can also draw from the bottom of the deck. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Odds are the same no matter how because you shuffle them randomly. Lastly, you want to shuffle and stack all the room cards. These do include expansion cards, so the stack is a little bit larger than it would normally be, but it's still a pretty large game, including extra dice that I bought through the Kickstarter. Uh, these dice are uh, custom dice, so they are 1 through 6, but uh, as you can see, it's not a D6, and it has various extra, like, f has a couple of 5s on it, or uh, it has more than one 6 on it. It has a, the 1 has um, this, it's hard to see, but it's a meteorite icon, like this, same icon on the die, so uh, it's really a D12 that is, but it's like a 2D6, uh, or sorry, it's a D12, but it's has uh, basically changing, slightly changing the odds because there's more than one face that has a six on it and more than one face that has a one on it. Um, alternative, and then finally you have these plastic stands that you will put your heroes in as well as the monsters when you draw them. So these cards, not only do they represent the stats of the monsters, but they're actually the monster um, that you will put into one of these plastic trays that then you can place on the board. The clear ones are for the yellow monsters and the red ones are for the red monsters, which are more difficult. Okay, so yeah, during the adventure phase, you can take any amount of actions that you have action tokens remaining. Uh, you'll take them one by one if you're playing with more than one player. If you're playing by yourself, well, obviously you can take all the actions as quickly as you need to. During the adventure phase, the adventurers, depending on how many number of players you have, will take their actions. What, if you have more than one player, then you take turns starting with the player who has the Comet track, which will change hands every round, um, and the round is in including the adventure phase, tomb phase, and combat phase. Um, so if you have the Comet Trail icon, which starts at zero, the beginning of the game, you would then go first, and you would do your first action. Then the next player would go, so on and so forth, and you go around the table till everybody has done their actions. If you have more actions than the other players, which is possible based on courage and cards, you would then take all the remaining actions after everybody else has gone as well. So, what are the actions? The actions you can take is move, search, combat a target, use a special ability, use an item, artifact, or companion, pick up an item or artifact, rest, trade with other adventurers, deal with the soul mongler, who you have to be on the soul monger tile, which in the beginning of the game is this, is a, one of the setup tiles, but he can also appear in other tiles that are within the tomb. Uh, you could also steal. And steal, like, usually you would steal from, like, another player, but and since the game is co-op, you generally don't... I didn't really, in the plays that I've done, have that come up. But you have the option. Uh, movement, the way it works, is all the character sheets have a movement value. So Theodore has a movement of four. So he can move up to four spaces. Um, when you want to move, you can move... A movement is one tile, so one two down the stairs would be three which leaves him one more movement at this point i can exit a room on the level two which is uh going downwards in the tomb which i misspoke earlier when i said you go up to level three you're actually going down um so level two you're going down to this tile here or you can spend one movement to go outside of this tile now like some other games like Betrayal House on the Hill, when you explore a new tile, um, you will flip over the tile as long as it matches the level that you're on. So as you can see from this tile, it's level one through three, while this tile would only be a level one tile. If you, have, if you find a tile that matches the room you're in, you place it face up, and you have to match one of the comet tails that's on the tile to a comet tail that you're exiting from or entering from. So in this particular one, if I were to draw this, I would line it up however I saw fit, but the entrance has to match an entrance. So I would place it like so, adding it to the board and moving my character into this room. Now, my movement stops in this room because, as you can see from this tile, so the, as you can see, well, as it's hard to see, unfortunately, on this card, on this tile, 
The bottom here has a magnifying glass with a plus one to knowledge. So when you explore this room, meaning when you enter this room for the first time and uncover it, the adventurer that explored it gets a plus one to their knowledge. And then that effect will never trigger again. The icon in the upper left hand corner means that when I enter this room, I have to go on adventure. In the upper left hand corner, it has a story icon, which is a compass. This means that when you also explore the room, you do this first, you, once you are finished with that adventure, if you're still in the room, then you would get the bonus at the bottom, which in this case was the plus one knowledge. But here you grab an adventure, so you would either have your friend draw it, which is a little bit more fun, or if you're playing by yourself, you would just draw it yourself. And on one side it says adventure, on the other side it says misadventure. So in this particular room, where my Theodore Roosevelt is, I would go on an adventure. On the adventure it says the new the Neiman lion was the greatest of the kind, a kind of predator with a strange Greek carving on the wall tells you, as you read more about the lion, the carving begins to come to life. And then it has a flexing muscle on it, which corresponds to strength. So in this case, I would do a strength check. Theodore Roosevelt has a strength of three, so I gain three dice, roll them. Once they're resolved, I would look at the titles. I have two fives here and a four. The four is a failure. But the two fives are a success. You succeed on a five or a six. So then I would read, or my friend, if he was reading the card, would read out loud either the top part, which is the success part, or the bottom part, which is the failure part. To avoid spoilers, I won't read it out loud. But Lisa say, no matter which one you go with, sometimes you get a bonus, like uh, plus one to dexterity, plus one to knowledge, plus one to strength, an item, or whatever. And then sometimes there is a penalty. Generally, with adventurers, even if you fail, you still gain something. With misadventures, if you fail, it's usually pretty bad. If you succeed, it can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. So um, it's important to kind of just get the flavor and not necessarily worry about whether or not uh, it's going to be like success or failure and just kind of go with the flow. Um, but in this case, if, if I gain the plus one knowledge, which because I explored this room, I would then search through this pile of tokens which as you can see, there's a lot. Look for the matching symbol that is on um, the knowledge, which is a blue book. So I'll look through this to find a blue book, which there is one here. I know it's hard to see, um, so don't worry about it, but uh, it has a plus one or a plus two on it. You'd put plus one, and then if you gain it again, you flip it over and get plus two. This way you can keep track of all the additional skills you gain in that column. Uh, the next thing is you keep, you will be exploring this dungeon pretty thoroughly. So on your next action, you might move again. Uh, if there's no, um, if there's nothing in the room, that action is still over, but then you can obviously, then the next turn or the next whatever, when it comes around to you, you can do another action. Um, another thing, important thing about these tiles is some tiles like this tile and this tile have these triangles in the corner, and this one's a little bit easier to see because it's a big one triangle. Uh, this one is a little harder to read, which has two triangles with number two. Those correspond to the scenario book. If you uncover um, a tile with those icons on it, you look through the scenario book and then read out loud what it says. Generally, it'll say like when you first come to a one or a two, read this tile. If you come to a two or a three the second time, etc., etc. It's pretty self-explanatory and it's pretty easy to follow. The later missions, you might have rooms that repeat uh, earlier missions or simpler missions. Generally, like you enter a one uh, comet trail one, that only triggers the first time. These are generally where you find artifacts that are specific to that mission, encounter very specific monsters, um, and, and whatnot throughout your adventuring. On um, other tiles, like this tile, there'll be a text in gold, yellowish gold color. That text means that there's an artifact in that room. You have one attempt when you enter this room, and whoever enters this room can do it only once per game, but each player can attempt it to try to find that artifact. Once you attempt it and you fail, that artifact is lost forever for you. But then another player might come around and attempt it, and then they might find the artifact that you missed. Um, another tile that you might encounter are these trap tiles like this one, which have a trap mentioned in the upper left hand corner with a number that's how many times that trap can spring in that case you would grab a trap token place it on this card to indicate there's two traps here once the trap has sprung 
that many times, this room will no longer be a trap room and it should be a regular tile you can enter and exit. Uh, and then at the bottom it says, for example, with this tile, that if you fail a knowledge roll to avoid the trap, which has a three on it, um, then you gain negative five health. So you only need one success unless it says otherwise on the tile. And if you successfully get a five or a six on a knowledge roll, then you not, no penalty. Um, on this tile, you also will see a skull and crossbones. This means that there's a misadventure on this tile that you must do. And just like the event, the adventure one, you draw it from the adventure deck, flip it over to the misadventure side, read it out loud or have your friend read it to you, roll the dice, and you get to experience a misadventure. Uh, here, for example, a misadventure is like, what a genius you are. You have found a secret door to a dark room. When you enter, the, enter a control panel, lights up. It's huge and futuristic. You've never seen the likes of this before in your life. It must be from another time. Do an audacity check. So when doing an audacity check, the important thing to note here is your audacity will go up and down throughout the game. When you spend audacity, it will go down, obviously. When you uh, gain audacity or while exploring the dungeon, you may gain or lose audacity as well. And sometimes, uh, depending on your courage, you could in theory lose audacity. Um, but in this case, you would do an audacity check. You would check what is my current audacity on Theodore. Says I haven't spent anything. It would be four. I would get four dice in, in my hand. Roll, and uh, while that wasn't technically a legal roll, I got a six and a five, a four and a three. Now, so now I would have succeeded against that misadventure, and they would read the success part. The other thing to keep in note about audacity is you can spend audacity before you roll any dice for any dice pool and gain a success on a four, five, and six instead of just a five or a six. Also, you could spend audacity after your roll to re-roll dice. Um, so audacity is a resource as, as well as a skill that is pretty important to keep at a good level, but it's also in critical moments you can spend it to really kind of make the game a little bit easier for yourself. Uh, finally, after the adventurers have gone, and if you want to search a room, you would spend an action, you would roll, um, dice to see if you found any artifacts and then turn the search icon um, whether you were successful or not you could use an item or a companion some items and companions like the dog uh wasn't was it the dog no yep the dog has an action written on it which means that you can spend your, one of your actions to do the action the dog would do which in this case was to trade with a, another venture up to five rooms away um you can pick up items or artifacts that are, that are in a room because a player died or a monster dropped them or whatever for an action. You, if you're in the same room as another adventure, which if you're playing in a one-player game with only one adventure, it doesn't apply. But if you are in the same room, then you can trade items. Um, you can go on a Soulmonger icon, then you can spend an action and go through the deck and buy Soulmonger stuff. Um, and finally, resting. Uh, basically, you can rest for one action where you gain two health back. Um, you can gain two courage. Or you gain plus one of health and plus one of courage. So if you're running low on courage or you want to boost your courage or you're running low on health, a rest icon can be very useful. Uh, and stealing, finally, you spend an action to try to steal an item from another player. Um, then you would, once you, everyone's on their actions or you decide to pass, you then can go on to the tomb phase. During the tomb phase, you would draw a tomb card. The tomb cards are either red or green. Depending on the difficulty you want to play the game, for easy, you'd only use green cards, which makes the game a lot easier. For hard, you would use mostly, if not only, red cards, which makes the game a lot harder. For normal, you would mix the two together, and you get a nice balanced game of, uh, of difficulty. On the tomb cards, you would first read the tomb effect, which is the number one. So, for example, with this card, which is a red card, says, all negative five combat during this tomb phase. So, as long as this card is face up during that phase, everybody would get negative five to their combat rolls which means that combat is going to be very, very rough that phase. The second thing you would do is you would move any creatures that were spawned. Those creatures would move towards the nearest player. Uh, you do any creature combat. If you are on the same spot as a creature, the creatures would then <clears throat> fight any adventurers that were in that spot. And then finally, you uh, sorry, then the next one you would spawn creatures. On this card it says uh, if you're in level one, you spawn one Yellow creature and one red creature, level two, one red, one yellow, and level three, nothing. Uh, and then finally, you go to upkeep, which is where you would refresh anything that you need to refresh. You could you would turn your search token by one. And 
your combat track meter would go up by one. Uh, why is that important? Well, the combat track meter, depending on the scenario you're in, could either lead to the end of the game, could lead to the monster boss respawning, can make things harder or easier. It just depends on the scenario. In an introduction scenario, when the combat track reaches six, is when the big bad boss will spawn. Now, as you're going through, the other important thing to note about locations is some locations do spawn monsters. Some locations do not spawn monsters. It depends on their color. So a red room like this one, which you can see the outline here is red. The downside is if you're colorblind, you unfortunately won't be able to see that being red. But uh, so it'd be nice if they had an icon on it that indicated spawning so that someone who is colorblind could still easily tell that it's a spawn room. Um, and so, but if it has a red border like this, it means that monsters will spawn in this room. They do not spawn the moment you flip them up. They spawn during the tomb phase when the card says that level gets a spawn. For each location that has a red one, if say, for example, you need to spawn one yellow, you can choose which room, if there's more than one red room, to spawn that creature. Um, if there is only one room and you're spawning more than one monsters, well, tough luck, they all spawn in that one room. When spawning monsters, you would spawn them in the red room. If there's more than one red room, you can choose which room to put the monsters in. If there's only one, all the monsters will spawn in that room. The advantage is if there is no red rooms on that level, or they haven't been revealed yet, then you don't spawn any monsters, so you're safe for that round. Um, and you keep going until the boss spawns. In the first scenario, the boss spawns, um, on, I believe, in the Pharaoh's Hall, and then will try to run out the door. Um, so the important thing is that once the monster boss does spawn, you want to basically be running towards him and slowing him down by attacking him and trying to kill him. Um, the important thing about the characters, which is easier to see on a boss character, is they have various stats here. They have special abilities at the top with their type of character name. Um, in the basic monsters, if, they're, if it's red or has this icon in the corner, then it means that they are a red monster or a hard monster, which matches the icon on the back of that particular stack. Uh, the different stats here that are important is movement, which this boss monster has a four, this boss monster has a courage of seven, a, da uh, a combat rating of 13, a defense rating of three, a health rating of 33, a um, soul shard of 17, and a, an evade of two which is a foot with a wing on it, um, which all pertains mostly to combat, but for that boss, also movement. So when the, when the creatures move during the tomb phase, you would move all the creatures that, have been, that were spawned in the previous round because it happens before spawning that many spaces. Normally they move towards the closest adventurer, the boss moves towards the entrance. So he moves pretty fast, so once he spawns, you definitely want to get to him as quick as possible and fight him. Um, and during the combat phase, you, if you initiate the combat, it's slightly different, but the basic combat is the same. If you're in the same space as a monster, and during the tomb phase, during the combat, what the creature does is when they attack you, you can try to evade them. And that's where the evade value is important. So with the boss monster, with an evade of two, it means you need two successes in order to successfully evade that monster. Uh, if you successfully evade it, he does not attack you, and you're able to basically ignore that monster. Uh, if you're in the same, if you start in the same room as a monster, you can easily move away from the monster or choose an action to attack that monster. Uh, the first, the second thing that happens that if you do actually initiate combat, meaning you fail your evade check or you decide to fight the monster for the first time, you lose courage, which is equal to their courage rating. So for this boss, you're going to lose seven courage. That is huge. Because if you're, unless you're at a really high courage, which gives you extra bonuses, like for example, Theodore, at a courage of four or greater, you gain plus one movement, at a courage of seven or greater, plus one action, at a courage of 10 or greater, plus one companion. Now the advantage here is that if you get a plus one companion, he's, some of these are permanent. Others, you uh, could potentially lose them if you lose courage. But the key here is that you would take seven damage, so you've got to have your courage high. Once you've uh, just basically lost your courage, you then, as long as you're still standing and you haven't fleed, um, you create a combat dice pool. The way that works is you take your combat attribute. So if it's a uh, dexterity weapon you're using, you would take your dexterity value. If it's a strength weapon you're using, you would take your strength value, plus any bonuses from the items, plus any other modifiers. Count that all up, 
roll that many dice. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can also determine if you want to use Audacity ahead of time to make four, five, or six successes, or if you're not going to use them. You roll the dice on a five or a six. If you didn't use Audacity, you successfully do one damage per a five or a six. Uh, and then you can determine if you want to re-roll by using Audacity. If you just every, if everything is good, you compare that to the combat rating of the creature, which on this creature is the fangs, which is a 13. If your successes exceed or, uh, sorry, if, you, if the combat rating exceeds the number of successes, so let's say I got three successes against the boss, the boss has a combat rating of 13, I failed that by 10, it means that I lose health equal to that difference. So I would lose 10 health. And then basically, if you have a shield icon, like you have armor, that would also reduce the amount of damage you take. So you, at this point, check that value. Uh, then for each point of armor that the creature has, like this creature has three, it would absorb a success. So this creature has three. That means if I rolled a five or a sixes and I only got three successes, if there were three fives, I did zero damage. That was a failed attack. If I got a six, six always hit. They ignore armor. So if I got one six and two fives, I would do one damage, but then the other three, two, would get absorbed by the shield. Finally, uh, if the creature's still standing, then basically that action is over, the next player would go, if it was during the action phase. If it was during the tomb phase, then, that, then if that creature did any damage to you in the combat, and you rolled a one, you would then do this, basically what it says at the top of the text here, which is, the Mummy's Curse, Curse of the Tomb. So you get a Curse of the Tomb status card. Uh, some status cards, they don't really stack. They, they're individuals, they're pretty self-explanatory. It means that you'd only get it, you could potentially get it once, but status cards are pretty terrible. Uh, if the creature dies, then you gain the amount of soul mongols based on the icon here, and the amount of courage equal to um, that monster. So this monster would give you seven courage and 17 shards. So just to reiterate, you would look on the, your, your reward is based on the value of that creature that you only get by defeating the creature. So bosses are worth a lot, while yellow creatures are worth less and red creatures are worth more. I to really would like to also point out that on some creatures like the scarabs, they have a swarm icon. You'll notice here it has an X, if you can see it. If not, uh, on the fang here, there's an X. That means that this is equal to the swarm value. So at the top here, it says swarm X equals six. So you would take six swarm tokens and place it in the room with this monster. Now there's basically what that means is there's six of these monsters. So their combat rating is equal to the number of monsters in that room that are still alive based on the swarm tokens only. So the beginning, it has six strength. Then as you do more damage to it, it goes down to five, to four, to three, to two, to one. So as you eliminate the swarm, it gets easier and easier to combat the monster. <clears throat> but you have to kill all the swarms off in order to successfully defeat the monster. So the game then goes on to the next turn. You hand over the, the, the comet trail to the next player, so on and so forth, until you get to the end of the game. Now, if, you had killed, if we had killed the pharaoh, which is the boss, we'd win the game. The game would be over, you have big celebrations, and yay. Uh, if you, all the players died, or um, you failed, or the, or the pharaoh guy made it, out of the tomb by running, then you would lose the game, everybody would be sad, drinks around the house. Uh, Non-alcoholic, preferably, but if you're old enough, feel free to bust out the booze because you let the world get destroyed. Um, that's basically how this game works. Alright, so overall, I love this game. I give this game a pretty strong 8 out of 10. Uh, I really want to give the game a 10 out of 10 because it's a lot of fun and it blends two of my favorite games together, which is like Arkham Horror uh, with the mythos and the adventures and kind of the story, as well as Betrayal House on the Hill, where you have scenario-based and exploration of dungeons. Um, expansions add things like traders and elite missions and more misadventures and adventures and items to really give diversity to the game. You can lump all the expansions together or try to make it a little bit more thematic by separating them to be like the end of the world apocalypse type of adventure or like Nazi zombies or something like along those lines. You can tweak it how you see fit. It's really designed to do either. My biggest complaint with these games that basically is why 
it got an 8 instead of a 10 is the components themselves. Uh, a lot of the artwork is just beautiful. Um, like the monster cards are really gorgeous looking monster cards. The miniatures are beautiful, which are extra. Um, but everything is really hard to read. Um, for example, on these character sheets, as you can see on the back here, it's green text on black text. And it's small font. So if you don't have great eyes, then you're going to have trouble reading it. And then if you even if you do good, have, have good eyes, the color contrast really makes it hard to read some of these cards. And when you're sitting at a table and looking down at the tiles, you have to pick up the tiles a lot because it's really hard to make out some of the icons. And some of the tiles have bright white backgrounds like this tile, which makes the text at the bottom here that's in white almost impossible to read unless you look really closely. Also, some of these, uh, I noticed that some of the tiles had icons on that were slightly faded a little bit, like a misprint kind of thing. So it made it really hard to distinguish what it was. The dice are black on green as well, which kind of is easier to read because it's a number, but it's also a little bit harder than if they use black and red or white and black or something that contrasted better. Um, the action tokens are also kind of small, so it's pretty hard to see from a distance how many actions someone may have left. These pegs don't quite, they fit fine in the, in the holes here, but the cardboard is pretty thin. Uh, I wish they had made this a little bit thicker so these pegs could fit in more snugly and as well as they don't bend as much and they, they do warp a little bit. Uh, the dials are fine. Um, the cards themselves are also pretty straightforward, pretty easy to read. There's a lot of pieces to this game too, which someone like me who loves games with lots of bits, it's great, but for other people it might be a little overwhelming. Uh, also the plastic standees, as I learned while filming this review, uh, seem to spontaneously bust apart um, without touching them two of them just like, blew up so uh, that's unfortunate because there's a limited number of these um, and you're using them both for heroes and monsters which is why I recommend getting the miniatures because they don't have to worry about these as much um, and finally the other kind of my well these are all kind of minor issues they don't really ruin the gameplay which is great uh, there's just a lot of stuff to remember and I kind of wish they had player mats where you could have maybe more dials for actions and audacity and health and even for courage and then have these character sheets maybe were a little bit bigger that you could place like your stats and stuff on it so that way it's just a little bit more condensed because having all this stuff spread out on a table unless you have a large table when you play with six players that's a lot of stuff to keep track of um so they're kind of minor complaints also on the item cards the font is really small because they use the smaller kind of cards so sometimes it's hard to read these icons and understand what they mean. There are some uh, misprints in the game that made the rules a little bit more confusing, but the designer of the game is very good about responding to people on BoardGameGeek. So if you ever have questions or concerns or whatever, go on BoardGameGeek, ask questions, you'll get a pretty quick turnaround time and get pretty good answers. Uh, otherwise, the game is pretty easy to play. Uh, we played it twice without any problems uh, after explaining the rules and setup. Do note, setup takes a long time. There's lots of things to separate, there's lots of bits to put away, and there's a lot of sorting to be done. So, I highly recommend that you play the game, but make sure you set enough time aside to really play it. To conclude this review, I would like to talk about, like, would this, does this belong on your shelf, or is there room on your shelf for this game? I would say yes. Even if you're, as long as you are a fan of games like Arkham Horror, Betrayal of House on the Hill, um then you would really, really enjoy this game because it's a nice marriage of the two. If you don't like those games, you think they're too long, they're too, luck is too random, then no, I wouldn't recommend this game. This game is heavy on luck and it does use a lot of story elements and a lot of stuff. Um, but if you do like those, that, if you don't mind luck games and you like games like Portrayal where they, where they have like room exploration and story moments and Arkham Horror kind of like unveiling the mythos and really fighting unsurmountable odds, then this game absolutely will fit perfectly with your gaming circle or your gaming group and is a lot of fun. And the flavor text, while they're kind of hit or miss, some are really cool and interesting. Some are kind of like, oh, okay, that happened. Nothing much occurred. Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely think you have room on your shelf for this game if you like these type of games. But if you're in more of a Euro player and you don't really care much about theme and luck, then stay away. Thank you and have a great day.